When Ai Jen Poo spoke earlier about care and a caring majority and a caring heart, there are certain timeless things about how we relate to one another as humans, about how we live together in community that don't depend on the technologies we're using, the devices we have, the kinds of systems we've built around us and uh, social structures. Those are timeless things. But one of the most timeless things, paradoxically, is how we adapt to change in all of those external institutions and technologies and structures around us. And our next two speakers are really going to help us bridge this, again, this tension between structures and institutions and systems that we've inherited and ways in which technologies and media of our time now enable and require us to engage each other in brand new ways. We're going to hear back to back now from two remarkable luminaries that we're so excited to have here today. First, we're going to hear uh, from Gavin Newsom, who many of you remember was the mayor of San Francisco uh, and really one of the, back on the issue of marriage equality, one of the catalysts who helped move both his city and his state and our country toward a tipping point on, on acceptance of marriage equality, uh, but now has uh, been serving as Lieutenant Governor of California. Uh, uh, but in my book, as an author, uh, his uh, greatest claim to fame is that he is an author as well uh, of a book uh, just recently out called Citizenville, uh, which he's going to tell us a little bit about. And then he's going to be followed by another remarkable thinker, practitioner, and expander of our imaginations named Stephen Johnson writer of several best-selling books, most uh, recently, Future Perfect. Before that, a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. And as a writer and a practitioner, somebody who understands the way in which innovation happens across all different sectors and how we can innovate and reimagine citizenship and our relationship to all these institutions around us. So please join me first in welcoming Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, I, I, I want to I be responsible for my order. I don't want to follow someone like Laura. That's just mean spirit. I, I, I got, I'm trapped in a terrible political system, but I can't say uh, I have the life experience Laura has. Uh, Eric, thanks for the introduction. I am your token politician uh, for the day. You, you had to have one, right? Uh, God bless you. Uh, I am from San Francisco, a wacky and wonderful place that probably was best described uh, by someone as 47 square miles surrounded by reality. Uh, it, it is a, a city of dreamers, of doers, of entrepreneurs, of innovators, and, and a city that uh, has long prided itself on being on the leading and cutting edge of new ideas. And I was privileged, as Eric noted, to be a two-term mayor in San Francisco, now uh, lieutenant governor, uh, now the butt of my own jokes. I, I, I know exactly what you know about lieutenant governors, uh, that we just pick up the paper, what's left of them every day, and uh, we just read the obituaries looking for the governor's name. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> I know that's mean-spirited to those hard-working lieutenant governors out there, but it's given me a little bit of time, uh, time to reflect and put my thoughts together, and as a consequence, I was able to put together a book that was inspired, as many of you were inspired, regardless of your political stripes, by the 2008 presidential campaign. That extraordinary effort, mybarackobama.com, 35,000 self-organizing communities coming together in a two-way conversation with candidate Obama. An opportunity to build community and to advance, as was the principle of that campaign, the fundamental idea that change begins from the bottom up a campaign that mesmerized and galvanized these dispersed communities into one extraordinary influential effort and a successful one. The opportunity presented itself, didn't it, after Election Day to not just campaign using these tools of technology, not just to campaign with this kind of engagement of a two-way conversation, but the opportunity to transition those voices to continue that conversation and to govern in a similar manner. You may recall the effort that President then-elect Obama made to say the same thing. He said, you know what? We don't want this campaign to end. We want your voices heard. We want to continue this conversation. Please join me with a new platform we're creating called change.gov. The homepage of change.gov said we've got a war in Iraq. 
We've got a war on terror, war in Afghanistan. We've got huge challenges with climate change and a financial meltdown all around us. Share your voice. Let's engage in this ongoing conversation. What should I focus on in the first 100 days of my administration? They've put together a town hall, not dissimilar to this, virtual town hall with all of those communities engaged. And the president did what exactly his wife did a few weeks ago at the Academy Awards. He opened up the envelope of sorts. So what's on your mind? Was it getting out of Iraq? Was it dealing with this war on terror, the climate change issue? What was the number one thing on people's minds for change.gov for the first 100 days? Legalizing marijuana. <laughs> the president, I know, see, we got some, I know where I am, right? Seattle. <laughs> of course, I know where I come from, San Francisco. But that was the president's response. He, he made a similar remark as you made. He kind of just rolled his eyes and laughed, and the online community didn't think it was so funny. They said, Mr. President-elect, we, we, we actually heard that you wanted to engage in a two-way conversation. This is what's on our mind. This is what we care about. All those other things are important. We know you're going to do the right thing, but we want you to engage in this kind of focus. So what did the president do? All that promotion and promise, well, he does what most politicians do. He put the site up for reconstruction. <laughs> Change.gov, you can Google it right now or Bing it. I know where I am, Microsoft. You can bring it right now. Change.gov was transitioned to the one-way White House website. The two-way conversation ended right after that process. We engaged after he became elected in that one-way broadcast model. That bottom-up candidate became, and I am a huge supporter, a top-down president, governing not dissimilarly to how we all tend to govern elected officials. You vote, guys like me decide. One-way conversation in a world where you all know better. Blair came up here. He knows better. Starbucks knows better. Where one-way conversations are dead. Where the tools of technology that help amplify those voices and help organize the effort to get the president elected are changing the rules of not only engagement, but changing the rules of the game. And remember, the president campaigned on this fundamental. We don't want to change the players. We want to change the game. You've seen what's happened in the last half decade or so, haven't you? Don Tapscott has written so beautifully about it. This idea that the Internet is changing hierarchy and large organizations in ways none of us could have conceived. Think about what's happened to the media industry, the newspaper industry. I am now learning about the publishing industry with my book. You see what's happened in the music industry. It wasn't just that many years ago we were all buying albums. Now we buy songs. Generation now of choice, not standard. We have a framework that's taking shape. I have an uncle. Some of you may actually know that person intimately. The good old days when he was a stockbroker. He said we'd have a martini at one in the afternoon, a cigar. Life was great. No one had any choice. They came through me. I had big commissions. It was great. Until Charles Schwab came along and E-Trade, and all of a sudden technology challenged that construct. You're seeing the same contours of that change in transportation with the sharing economy and Lyft and Uber cabs and other things that will become part of our nomenclature in the next few years. I argue in my book fundamentally that government now is on a collision course with the future. This industrial economy is running out of gas because at the end of the day, technology does nothing less than this. It democratizes voices and it takes power and it shifts it to people. What was once centralized, what was once hierarchical, what was that top-down thinking is now being replaced with decentralized thinking and decentralized engagement. Again, self-organizing community. Stephen will... We use the tools of technology extraordinarily well, relatively speaking, to get elected, but we use them horribly to govern. And my argument is if we want to engage in active citizenship, as opposed to government doing things to you in one-way conversations. If we want to engage in that two-way conversation, we need to meet you where you are. And we need to engage 
in a dialogue about how we can modernize not only the tools of technology as it relates to how we govern at a local, state, and national level, but the culture to which we engage in that conversation. So that's what the framework of my book's about. It allowed me the opportunity to interview about 68 people. One of them, Tom Freeman, who I'm sure you've all heard of, wrote a book called The World is Flat, 2005 on the New York Times bestseller list. And I had the opportunity to ask him, I said, Tom, what world are we living in? And he said, let me explain it as succinctly as I can. When I wrote that book, The World is Flat, in 2005, I talked about information technology and globalization, a connected world, he said. 2005. He said, if you go back in that book, he says, Facebook is not even there. Twitter, he said, was a sound. The cloud in the sky, 4G, a parking space, linked in a prison. Apps were things you filled out to get in the University of Washington. And Skype, as Blair was saying earlier, Skype for most of us was a typo. His point, we're not living in a connected world anymore. We're living in a hyper-connected world. All those things, Twitter, Facebook, the cloud, 4G, LinkedIn, all those things are ubiquitous and part of our nomenclature, part of our lives. They didn't exist as we know them seven or eight years ago. In fact, Twitter just celebrated this week its seventh anniversary. No longer connected, but a hyper-connected world. Yet government, including Seattle, I say with respect, is on the cutting and leading edge, technologically speaking, of 1973. <laughs> California's DMV, 40-year-old plumbing technology. Sure, we have fancy websites, but it's a 40-year-old backbone in the state of California. Again, that state of dreamers, of doers, of entrepreneurs, of innovators. Hardly on the leading and cutting edge. One-way conversations, you vote, we decide. It's that machine thinking that Eric wrote about in that beautiful book, Gardens of Democracy, right? Government operates like this. You give me a dollar, your taxes, you put it in that big vending machine. If you don't like the dollar, we can say, all right, give me a trillion quarters. You put it in the vending machine, out comes on the bottom, police, fire, health care, education, national defense. If you don't like what you get, you've all done this. What do you do with the machine? You kick it. You shake the machine, right? That's the machine thinking, the machine model of government we have today versus the framework of a new orientation of thinking, and that is government as a platform as a conduit, not the assembly line thinking, but this idea of a platform not dissimilar to the way Steve Jobs conceived of the smartphone. Remember, when Jobs came out with that smartphone, that iPhone, he didn't come out with 800,000 apps. He came out with only a dozen or so just to give you a sense of what's possible. And what he did is he opened up an opportunity to partner with millions of people. And we're now all the beneficiaries of that, our Android platforms, whatever the platform may be. That kind of thinking opens up a different framework. The finite thinking of government as a vending machine with limited choices, not much you can do until the next election day, versus a framework of active citizen engagement, an iterative engagement, a two-way conversation, government as a platform coordinating, cultivating ideas day in and day out, a division of labor, not e-government, but we government, a new framework of thinking, using technology as that platform for a different kind of citizen engagement. The only thing Blair said that I disagree with, and he was fabulous, was this idea that came from the table I sat next to, which was beautiful, of that we should petition government to do things for us. I don't buy that anymore. See, the president has something called We the People. It's a petition site. If after 5,000 people sign a petition, poor Jay Carney has to respond. You may recall after Newtown, you had some radical out there at CNN named Pierce Morgan who decided to get aggressive about the NRA. People were offended about this, especially coming from a guy that came from the country that forced us to bear arms in the first place. <laughs> and they said it's time to deport Pierce back to his home country. 
They not only had 5,000 petition signatures, they had tens of thousands. And Carney's sitting there going, you've got to be kidding. I'm in the middle of sequestration. I've got to talk about a newscaster. So what did they do? They just raised the threshold for petitions before Carney had to respond, missing the whole point. It's well intended. There's a Death Star petition. You may have signed it. <laughs> but the whole idea is not to petition us to do things for you. That's the old industrial model of thinking. It's to create a new mechanism where we can do things together. It is a new way of thinking about the relationship between government and all of us as active, not inert, participatory citizens. And I encourage you to think along these lines. Don't encourage by sending petition me to do more for you. It's about us Enveloping a new relationship. It's about me devolving my power in involving you. It's about more choices and more voices. Amplifying an engagement where you feel truly participatory. Not just on election day, but every day. More engaged, more in power. You find more meaning, more substance. You're enlivened. Final point, because I only have a minute left. And you know politicians with microphones. This is difficult for me. <laughs> this book is certainly about citizenship. It's called Citizenville. It's about technology by definition, rift from Farmville and the gamification, social games for good, meeting people again where they are. But it's about leadership. It ultimately concluded with me about leadership. And I challenge you to think about this in my remaining seconds. Think about what Martin Luther King at the peak of his influence shared with Gandhi and Mandela and Vlachov Havel. Think about the peak of their influence. I challenge you, what did Mandela, King, Gandhi, and Havel all have in common at the peak of their influence? For some of the younger folks, I'll remind you, jail time. Think about that. These guys radically changed, not their countries, but the contours of the world we're living in. And at the peak of their influence, they shared Dale time. They shared one other thing in common. None of them, at the peak of their influence, had formal authority. They weren't elected to do things. They exercised their moral authority. They stepped up and they stepped in. And this is a powerful distinction, moral versus formal Authority. You can argue, as Havel himself, who became president of Czechoslovakia, that his influence waned. He lost it when he became president of Czechoslovakia. You can argue accordingly that Mandela lost his authority when he became president of South Africa. And the point I'm making is an important point to all of you as citizens. And you don't need me to make this. You are here because you understand this. You don't need to be something, to do something. I would argue now, particularly with these tools of technology and all the peer-to-peer -peer engagement that Stephen will talk about in a moment, that you have now the capacity more than ever to connect with like-minded people in a peer-to-peer -peer way to radically alter the life of your community, your state, and nation in the world we're trying to build. You have remarkable capacity you don't need to wait around for the guy or gal on the white horse to save the day. You don't need to wait around, as my old favorite documentary called Waiting for Superman. We don't need to wait around for Superman. It's time to step up and step in, to share your voice and that remarkable power, that authority that you have when you share your moral authority and stand up on principle and conviction and begin to use the democratizing and participatory power of social media to amplify that voice. That's my message. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share it. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>